Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfectionalis, which sounds exactly like Dermatosis Intestinalis. Oh, this joke is getting old. Today we'll talk about rheumatoid arthritis again. In the previous video, we started talking about the clinical features. We talked about the articular manifestations. Today we'll talk about something weird, but very important, called atlantoaxial subluxation, also known as cervical spine subluxation. Joints are divided into fibrous, fibrocartilaginous, and synovial. Fibrous, no movement. Example, sutures of the skull. Fibrocartilaginous, limited movement, such as symphysis pubis, intervertebral discs, important for today's lecture, costochondral and sacroiliac joint, also important for today's lecture. Then we have synovial joints, most extremity joints, atlantoaxial joint, important for today's lecture, costovertebral and temporomandibular joint, or TMJ. Rheumatoid arthritis, the hallmark of the disease is synovitis. Therefore, rheumatoid only involves the synovial joints. That's why rheumatoid arthritis can involve the atlantoaxial joint between C1 and C2. Rheumatoid does not involve fibrocartilaginous joint. Therefore, no involvement of the intervertebral disc with the exception of C1, C2. No involvement of the sacroiliac joint. And this is different from ankylosing spondylitis, one of the seronegative spondyloarthropathies that involve the SI joint or sacroiliac joint. No involvement of the intervertebral disc in rheumatoid. There is involvement of the intervertebral disc in case of degenerative disc disease, which is similar to osteoarthritis. In the previous video, we have discussed the symptoms of rheumatoid, especially the articular manifestations, with exceptions of this one. So today's topic, we'll talk about C1 and C2 joint, also known as atlantoaxial subluxation. We'll talk about the complications and the associations. In the next video, we'll talk about the famous extra-articular manifestations. Cervical spine subluxation in rheumatoid. Here is the atlantoaxial joint, C1 and C2 vertebra and the joint in between is called the joint of Lushka. Lushka, the same person who discovered the foramen in your brain because you have a foramen in your brain, you have foramens in your skeleton and a foramen in your um, sphincter, but let's keep it clean. Did I say foramens? It's called foramina or it can involve the subaxial joint below C2, but mostly C1 and C2. Risk factors. Seropositive rheumatoid arthritis, long-standing rheumatoid arthritis for years, especially if rheumatoid factors and CCP are positive, especially if the rheumatoid arthritis is active, especially if you have other extra-articular manifestations, you are at high risk of getting cervical spine subluxation. Why the C1 and C2 joint and not the rest of the vertebral column? Because this is the only synovial joint in the freaking vertebral column, and rheumatoid arthritis affects synovial, that's why the hallmark of the disease is called synovitis. Why not the thoracic, the sacral, the lumbar spine? Because those are fibrocartilaginous joint, and rheumatoid arthritis only affects the synovial joints. Of course, your professor didn't tell you that, because here is the sad story of the current medical education. You're taught anatomy by an anatomy professor. Pathology by another professor, internal medicine by a third professor, and no one has ever connected the dots for you. You're lost in the middle, or as they say in America, you're wandering around the field trying to find the fins. With medicosis, this will happen no more. Question, does osteoarthritis affect the lumbar vertebra? Yes, why? Because osteoarthritis is biomechanical. It affects the weight-bearing joints, therefore it affects the lumbar because it's carrying your entire freaking weight of your body. Question number two. Does rheumatoid arthritis affect the lumbar? No. Why not? Because rheumatoid arthritis has nothing to do with the weight-bearing or mechanical stuff. Rheumatoid is all about some nasty O2 antibodies causing synovial inflammation. Synovial. Synovial. Got it? Okay. Let's move on. When should you suspect cervical spine subluxation in rheumatoid? If there is active, long-standing, seropositive rheumatoid arthritis with extra-articular manifestations and any one of the following. Recurrent occipital headache. 
This is not tension headache. Get your head out of your sphincter. This could be an emergency. Pay attention. Neck pain. Again, it's not tension. Decrease neck range of motion because this is inflamed and your skull is mounted on top of this joint. If this is inflamed, you're not gonna be able to move your skull like to the right and to the left. Neurological deficits, why? There's a spinal cord here in the middle and the inflammation can affect leading to weakness of the upper extremities because the nerves are coming here and they don't have enough supply. Paresthesia of hand and feet. What is paresthesia? Paresthesia, I like to think of it as the mnemonic of twos. Everything here is gonna be two, baby. Everything is gonna be two. So, tingling and numbness. Pins and needles. Limb is asleep. And you have formication. Not to be confused with fornication. I'm a bad boy. What the flip is formication? It's the sensation of crawling insects on your skin. And it's common after substance abuse. What should I do then? If you suspect atlantoaxial subluxation, then you should order x-ray of the cervical spine with flexion and extension views. Why not use MRI? Honey, don't waste resources. Always think cheap. Start with the x-ray first. Now, if the x-ray showed subluxation, you should of course order an MRI of the cervical spine. Or on physical exam before doing the x-ray. If you have noticed neurological deficits, of course, go ahead and go the MRI, skip the x-ray. Why? because there is nothing in the world that shows the spinal cord and the nerves as clearly as the freaking magnetic resonance imaging. What are the complications of this horrible subluxations of C1, C2? Spinal cord compression. Why? Because of the penis. Do you remember the penis? Yep. It's inflamed granulation tissue with inflammatory cells and fibroblasts. MRI can show you the penis beautifully. Penis is not beautiful, but the ability of the MRI to show it to you is, oh, oh, is amazing. Compressive myelopathy. Pathy means pathology. Myelo means core. That's why the word myelo describes the bone marrow as well as the spinal cord. Why the bone marrow? Because the bone marrow is in the core of your bone. Why the spinal cord? Because the spinal cord is in the spinal canal or the vertebral canal inside your vertebral column. Makes sense. What else? Radiculopathy. I've told you a bazillion times before. If this is your freaking spinal cord, we have two types of problems. And here's a nerve, like here. If you injured the nerve in the periphery, this is called neuropathy. If you injured the nerve at the root, uh, while exiting from the spinal cord, this is called radiculopathy. If you injure the spinal cord itself, this is called myelopathy. Got it? First, let me remind you of the lens in your eye. So here are the, I don't know, like suspensory ligament. I don't know what they call them. Yeah, I think the zonules. Okay, anyways. First, this, let's dislocate this lens. Normally, it's stable. First, it starts with instability. We call it lens instability. Then the next stage is lens subluxation. What the flip does subluxation mean? It means partial or incomplete dislocation. So instability first, subluxation next, dislocation last. All right, dislocation or detachment or whatever you want to call it. So same thing here. We have first cervical instability, followed by subluxation. Maybe dislocation? Could be. So acute subluxation will lead to compression on the spinal cord or compression of the vertebral artery. You can even get ischemic stroke of the posterior half of your brain because this is what's supplied by the vertebral artery. The carotid supplies the front, the vertebral supplies the back, if you remember your anatomy. When you compress this stuff, you can end up with quadriparesis or quadriplasia, four limbs, inability to move, weakness, and even sudden death because of your brain stem. In other words, subluxation is a very serious business. You better pay attention. 
during endotracheal intubation. Never, never hyperextend the neck of a rheumatoid patient. Never, ever, without first obtaining an x-ray to make sure there is no subluxation. Now, let me ask you a couple of very difficult questions. What if there is an emergency and you have to intubate, but the patient has atlantoaxial subluxation? What should you do? Answer, you have two options. A. Secure the head and don't move it while you intubate. Or B. Nasotracheal intubation over a fiber optic bronchoscope. Second, very difficult question. What if there is an emergency and you have to intubate, but the patient has atlantoaxial subluxation and maxillofacial injury? What should you do? Since the patient has maxillofacial injury, you cannot do endotracheal or orotracheal intubation because the mouth and the nose are injured. So what should you do? You should perform a tracheostomy or a cricothyroidotomy. What's the treatment of this horrible condition? Surgery. You'll need stabilization and fixation. Stabilization of the cervical spine and fixation of the occipital cervical region. All right, we're done with the clinical symptoms. We talked about the articular, such as upper extremities, lower extremities, C1 and C2. Let's talk about complications. Secondary amyloidosis. Why? Because rheumatoid is a chronic inflammation. If you remember your pathology, secondary amyloidosis follows chronic inflammation. Do you remember primary amyloidosis? Yes, this is when you have cancer, aka multiple myeloma, secreting those stupid antibodies in the plasma, especially the light chains. So secondary amyloidosis, aka reactive systemic amyloidosis, because it's reactive to the chronic inflammation, AAA subtype and SAA protein. Anemia, ooh, anemia of chronic disease or normocytic normochromic, that's the most common type of anemia seen in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Type one or distal RTA, here. Let's review renal tubular acidosis in 10 seconds. Renal tubular acidosis type 1 affects the distal convoluted tubule. Renal tubular acidosis type 2 affects the proximal convoluted tubule. How about RTA type 3? It doesn't exist. How about RTA number 4? Low renin, low aldosterone. Boom. Next, we have reactive lymphadenitis or follicular hyperplasia. And the lymphadenitis was discussed in my note about lymphoma called Perfectionnel's Ultimate Notebook. You can get it on my Patreon page. And if you get it like really fast, you can get it for less than five bucks. Cool. Unintentional weight loss or even cachexia. And I have a great video about cachexia, which involves the protein cachectin and some cytokines such as interferon gamma, interleukin-6, and the famous TNF-alpha. By the way, cachexia makes you very thin. Next, we have Felty syndrome and TLGL, T-cell large granular lymphocytic syndrome. And if you go to Patreon and purchase my note about rheumatoid arthritis, I have discussed the difference between Felty and TLGL. Next, associations of rheumatoid arthritis. Other autoimmune diseases. Oh, please don't ever forget that. Autoimmune disorders are usually associated with other autoimmune disorders. Translation. Let's say you have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease. She is more likely to have other autoimmune disease. It's kind of an association. Okay. For example, you can have a patient with rheumatoid and Jogren. You can have a patient with rheumatoid and Graves. You can have a patient with rheumatoid and biliary cirrhosis and or systemic sclerosis, formerly known as scleroderma. Osteoporosis. Why? Because patients with inflammatory rheumatoid arthritis have inflammation. They use anti-inflammatory called glucocorticoids. Patients with rheumatoid have pain. They use pain medications such as glucocorticoids. Oh, I didn't know that glucocorticoids can be used as um, like analgesics. Yes, of course, because if there is no inflammation, probably there is no pain. Disability-related immobility. All of this can lead to osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is excellent anti-inflammatory drugs, but you risk avascular necrosis and osteoporosis. Okay.
can lead to hip fracture, which is horrible, especially in the elderly. The fatality rate of hip fracture is greater than that of myocardial infarction in the elderly population, believe it or not. Next, hypoandrogenism. Decrease LH, decrease DHEA, and decrease testosterone. Why? Okay, they are taking what? Glucocorticoids, leading to decrease FSH and LH secretion from the pituitary gland. Is it anterior or posterior? Let me know in the comments. Meanwhile, when you decrease those, you have decreased stimulation to your testes. They will decrease testosterone release and they will lead to hypogonadism because FSH and LH are food for testes. When there is no food for testes, your testes shrink. And this is the same reason why professional athletes who abuse anabolic steroids, aka testosterone, end up with hypogonadism, or as, li as I like to call it, big biceps, tiny testicles. If you want to get more notes about rheumatoid arthritis, go to patreon.com forward slash medicosis and download the great PDF. It contains lots of goodies, lots of notes about rheumatoid arthritis, the likelihood ratio, and the difference between the Felty syndrome and the garbage TLGL. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and join the tribe. Hit the bell to get notified. Go to Facebook, my Facebook page. I have more than 100 cases there. Follow me on all of these platforms. You can support this channel on Patreon. And I'll give you my great PDF notes about every single video in on this channel, which are like more than, I don't know, 500, I think. Thank you guys for watching. This is Medicosis Perfect Chanelos, where medicine makes perfect sense. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. Until next time.